Right now, Earth is traveling through a trail of ancient dust left behind by Halley's Comet, sending meteors streaking across the sky, with the shower about to reach its peak. And while that's lighting up the sky this month, the Milky Way core's largest nebulae are climbing higher into view. But not everything up there is distant. In fact, this month, a Cold War relic that's been drifting quietly in orbit for 53 years is finally falling back to Earth. I'm Sarah Matthews, and welcome to your Space Guide for May 2025, where we learn all about what's going on in the night sky. And later on, we're also going to be talking about a possible habitable world that's been making headlines, so stick around. But first, let's start a little bit closer to home with the moon and the planets, because early on in the month, the moon is going to appear as a beautiful crescent-shaped moon in the westward sky just after sundown. Now, meanwhile, from May 1st through May 6th, Mars is going to appear to travel through the Beehive Cluster, which is a beautiful globular cluster, so if you would like to take an image, that would be a great photo opportunity. So look to the constellation Cancer in the westward sky just after sundown. Then on May 3rd, which happens to be International Astronomy Day, the Moon is going to be pairing up with Mars in a beautiful conjunction in the westward sky, so be sure not to miss that, because that will be cool. But then, of course, the next day, which is May 4th, which happens to be Star Wars Day, sorry Star Trek fans, this also brings our first quarter moon, and it is the perfect time to bring out a long focal length telescope or a Barlow lens or do some eyepiece projection to get some really cool close-up shots of some awesome locations on the lunar surface due to the Terminator line, which provides a lot of contrast to areas that during a full moon that you just don't see. So this month, we're gonna be checking out something Star Wars related or something that I'm gonna be dubbing Star Wars related, and it kind of looks like a lightsaber. Try looking for Rupees Recta or the straight wall, and it's a long, sharp fault line that almost looks like a sword, sometimes referred to as the moon sword, but we're gonna be dubbing it a lightsaber this month. Then around the middle of the month, we have our full moon, and this month we're calling it the flower moon because of the springtime flowers are blooming. I'm sorry if you are in the Southern hemisphere, that's not gonna make a lot of sense, but you can call it whatever you would like. And this month, it's gonna be rising close to the bright red supergiant star Antares, which is located in the constellation Scorpius. And while we're looking up at the sky this month, and maybe you're asking yourself, is there something more out there? Well, the answer is yes. Back in 1972, the Soviet Union launched Cosmos 482, which was a spacecraft originally intended to travel to Venus, and not only travel there, but also land there, which if you're not familiar with what Venus is like, it is a fiery hellscape. But sadly, it suffered a critical malfunction that left it stranded in Earth's orbit. And that's where it's been ever since, just circling the Earth for the last 53 years. But after more than half a century, it's finally making its way back down to Earth. Now, Cosmos 482 is expected to enter Earth's atmosphere sometime between May 8th and May 11th. We're not totally sure at the exact date because that's going to depend on a lot of different factors. Fortunately for us, most of it will burn up in Earth's atmosphere. However, the extremely tough descent module, which, mind you, was designed to withstand Venus's extreme conditions, may make its way back down to Earth without burning up in Earth's atmosphere, but I'm not totally sure, and other people are not totally sure. So that will be kind of interesting. Are you and any of your loved ones in imminent danger? Well, the short answer is I'm not sure, but it's likely no because most of the Earth is covered by water. But what the exact location will be is kind of up in the air, quite literally, because um, we're not gonna know until it becomes much closer to those dates, so stay tuned. And speaking of things falling from the sky, not everything that is falling from the sky is man-made though. Right now, Earth is moving through a river of debris left behind by Halley's Comet, and it's about to peak this month. The Eta Aquarids meteor shower will reach its best around the evening of May 5th and the early hours of May 6th. Every meteor you'll see is a tiny fragment of Halley's Comet, about the size of a grain of sand or a small pebble. But don't let their size fool you. These particles slam into our atmosphere at around 66 kilometers per second. That's over 147,000 miles per hour. That incredible speed compresses the air in front of them, heating it up until it glows bright the same physics that makes spacecrafts burn during re-entry. Now, most meteors burn up completely at altitudes around 70 to 100 kilometers above the ground. And fun fact, the meteor shower is named after the constellation that the meteors appear to come from, which is the constellation Aquarius, but that doesn't actually mean that the meteors come from that constellation, so that's just called the radiant. And what's extra cool about this meteor shower is that it is inclusive of all hemispheres. Both the southern and northern hemispheres are going to be able to enjoy this wonderful meteor shower. If you're in the southern hemisphere on May 5th through May 6th, you may be able to check out 50 meteors per hour, just depending on where you are and how dark your skies are. 
And if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you may not be able to see as many meteors per hour. However, you do get to see what are called Earth grazers, which are meteors that skim across the Earth's atmosphere at low angles. And I come bearing more good news about the peak of this meteor shower because the moon is going to be rising and setting very early that night, which is wonderful. So you should be able to see more meteors because of it. So to get the best view, I would recommend heading out at least sometime after midnight and find yourself a place outside where you have very dark skies away from light pollution and give your eyes about 30 minutes to adjust to the dark. Now this is gonna be a great opportunity for some photography. So if you want to photograph it, use a DSLR or a mirrorless camera with an interchangeable lens. A wide angle lens is gonna be best. And of course using a tripod. Now I did put together a workflow on how to use specialized software to capture meteor showers. And if you're a patron of mine, you can get that over on my Patreon. So a special thanks to all of my amazing patrons for supporting this channel. I really couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. Now moving on to the bigger picture overhead this month, we are in full fledged Milky Way core season for both hemispheres, which is amazing. Around the new moon at the end of May, the skies are gonna be the darkest, which is gonna be perfect timing for capturing wide field Milky Way arcs or zooming in on our deep space objects. But of course you can image these anytime that you would like. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere or even the Southern Hemisphere, keep an eye out for the Rho-Ophiuchi Cloud Complex, which is rising later on in the month, and it is a beautiful, colorful region filled with glowing nebulae and dark dust lanes. But for hemisphere-specific nebulae this month, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I would recommend checking out the Cat's Eye Nebula, especially if you have a very long focal length telescope, it's going to be great. It's a beautiful planetary nebula in the constellation Draco. And for more of a wide field shot, check out the Iris Nebula, which is a beautiful dusty reflection nebula in the constellation Cepheus. Now for all of my Southern Hemisphere folks, the Cat's Paw Nebula is a beautiful colorful nebula that I would highly recommend, especially if you have narrowband filters, but you can also image it in RGB and it is a great wide field nebula. And you also have the Lobster Nebula, which is also a beautiful H2 region, which is going to make a great wide field or deep field shot. And this time of year, objects near the galactic bulge are rising higher in the night sky, which is great for imaging and for observing. So check those out. And speaking of what else is out there, in other space news, a possible habitable world just made more headlines. Astronomers using the James Webb Space Telescope detected molecules like dimethyl sulfide, DMS, in the atmosphere of exoplanet K2-18b. Here on Earth, DMS is almost entirely produced by living organisms, mostly microscopic life in the oceans. Now, that doesn't guarantee life elsewhere. However, it is one of the most promising leads we've ever seen. K2-18b orbits a red dwarf star about 120 light years away in a zone where temperatures could allow liquid water to exist. Now, more atmospheric signatures will have to be made, but it is a promising lead. So yeah, I hope you guys found this helpful. And until the next time, I hope you all have clear skies.